The Forbes article calls the 2023 recession a white-collar recession, as white-collar jobs, for example, in business services, tech, banking, and real estate sectors are at an increased risk of being cut. Biggest tech companies are laying off, worrying a lot of people in the tech field, including data science and machine learning field. Investment in AI and machine learning is slowing down, meaning less jobs and less budget for innovation research. Meanwhile, inflation is at a sky-high level globally. Here in the Netherlands where I live, inflation level reached 14.5% in September 2022. This means each euro in my bank account is now worth only 85 cents. These are definitely bad things to see. Things are uncertain and it will be no doubt a challenging time for many of us. But every crisis spawns new possibilities and I feel like a lot of content on the internet right now is focusing largely on the anxiety and on the negative side of things and don't talk talk enough about the silver lining and the opportunities that arise for us in the tech industry. So in today's video, I hope to shed some light on what recession fundamentally is, what is the silver lining and what we can do to prepare and even benefit from an economic downturn looking from a tech or data science career perspective. Without further ado, let's jump right into it. Are you ready? Let's go. To be honest, I never truly feel qualified to give opinions about the world or how the economy works, but after all, I had ground for five years for my economics degrees. Much of what I learned ended up being pretty useless for my data science career. But by all traditional measures, I think I can give you a quick tour of Macroeconomics 101 to get a better understanding of what's going on right now. From economics point of view, a recession is a business cycle contraction where there is a general decline in economic activity. That means the economy as a whole produces less output. This could be triggered by various events and crisis and we'll talk about the current situation in a minute. But it's important to realize that recession is just a phase in the business cycle. The economy had been going up and up for many years. In the past years, you could probably earn decently in the stock market even if you're a very bad investor. So at some point, the overheated economy has to go down. This could happen even just by itself. But once we are in a recession, after a while, usually in a few years, the economy will inevitably bounce back, either by itself or by interventions such as monetary policy and fiscal policy. If you're not familiar with those concepts, monetary policy involves the central bank changing the interest rate and influencing the money supply in the economy, while fiscal policy involves the government changing spending and tax rates to influence the economy. we we'll put them into context in a bit. The world is apparently very complicated and it's only getting more so, with many factors come into play and I don't know everything. But like any data nerds, I love explaining things by models. So to examine what's going on right now, let me introduce you to the good old macroeconomic model called aggregate demand, aggregate supply or ADAS model. This is going to be a very simplified narrative and it might not be complete, but it could be a very useful way to look at the world and help you make sense of what's going on. So this model says that in our economy, the price level and output level are basically determined by the relationship between aggregate demand and aggregate supply. So on the y-axis, we have the price level and on the x-axis, we have the real GDP output. Initially, the two curves meet at the long-run equilibrium. We have the full employment output. All things are well. However, during and after the pandemic, the supply chains have been basically messed up. Transportation and production were disrupted in many countries in Asia, causing a commodity shortage. This shift the aggregate supply curve to the left, meaning that the economy can now produce less output. And we all know with the war going on right now in Ukraine and the geopolitical instability, the energy price has increased, affecting especially Europe, making it more expensive to produce goods because production of anything needs energy. This further shifts the supply curve to the left. Meanwhile, post-pandemic, people are spending more on goods and services because after after all the lockdowns, you can finally go to restaurants and travel again. This shifts the demand curve to the right. And adding to that in response to the pandemic, governments, for example, in the US kept printing money and introduced large, perhaps too large stimulus packages to lower taxes and give subsidies to support companies and keep people employed. So with the overall increase in consumption and government spending, the economy as a whole is spending more. All these effects might have 
have overshot the demand curve to the right. So these two shifts of demand and supply result in a new situation where we see higher price level. This higher price level is exactly what we know as inflation. Inflation is not inherently bad. Historically, we have seen a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. When unemployment is low, inflation is high and vice versa. But if inflation is increasing and people's expectation of inflation is increasing, we might get into a wage inflation spiral. That's when people demand higher wages due to inflation, which in turn increases production costs and forces companies to raise their prices, thus causing even higher inflation. This would be a very dangerous situation where we spiral into something called stagflation, which is a combination of stagnation and inflation. To keep inflation in check, countries around the world are raising interest rates. Higher interest rates encourages people to save and invest more and discourage people from spending. Because with higher interest rates, it's more profitable for you to invest the money than to spend the money. This will help reduce the demand and helps reduce the inflation. However, with this monetary policy, we are also running the risk of overshooting the demand to the left and also limiting the supply. As companies struggle to borrow money and so they can produce maybe less output. When both demand and supply fall, the economy is at a risk of a recession where we see more unemployment. We've started to see that some of the effects that we just mentioned have hit tech companies pretty hard because companies like Google and Meta rely heavily on advertising revenue and computer makers like Microsoft and Apple also struggle with their profits because of the rising energy costs. Only when people keep investing more or the interest rate can go down again and releasing the limitation on the supply side. But there's another light of hope that is innovation and technology. This has happened in the 90s with advance of the internet and the development of information technology. The economy as a whole became much more productive and this created a supply shock. And this is obviously a very good shock because we could now produce more with the same level of input. I think this time AI, data science and machine learning could help do the same. And understanding this might help many of us recognize the opportunities lying around us in this field. With that, let's now move on to silver lining. One positive thing about the recession this time is that the job market still looks pretty good in most countries. The mass layoffs in big tech companies are probably outliers. In fact, small and medium-sized companies are suffering from talent shortage. In the last few years, it has been very tough for companies to attract and hold on to their workers because people seem to be more willing than in the past to look for better opportunities elsewhere. Also, job markets are tight as the baby boomers retire and leave the workforce. Many companies are actually now hoarding labor that they know they will need once the economy starts accelerating again. Looking from a company and other workplaces, the turnover in the past years has been incredibly high and so we have to keep hiring. And it's not easy to find people with the right skills and right experience. So if you have the in-demand skills in data science and engineering today, the job market is probably better than you might think. If you already have a job, now it's the time to learn to become irreplaceable at your work. That means to become so valuable to your company that it makes no sense to your employer to let you go. You could do this by upgrading your technical skills, learning new in-demand skills. For example, if you've always worked with Power BI and Excel, you can now try to learn how to code in Python, how to automate things and make yourself and other people more efficient. Always make sure you keep the habit of investing in yourself and constantly learning because in the tech industry, you can never get too comfortable. Take courses, read books, build a great portfolio on the site, and even combine work with getting another degree like I did. By doing all this, you can increase your intrinsic value and also create more value to your company. Besides technical skills, I noticed employers also value you from a community and team building perspective. If you're a crucial part 
like the team who can work well with people, who can glue people together and make things happen, you're obviously more irreplaceable. So it's always important to put extra efforts into networking, building good relationships inside and outside the company. So no matter what happens, you still have your network and relationships to fall back on. The next silver lining is that I believe an economic downturn could bring some transformative effects in the data science job market. With companies trying to cut costs and adopting new technologies to stay relevant, the quality of the jobs available might be improved. This is pretty much my own theory and we're yet to see what will happen, but I think we could expect that jobs with repetitive work like entering data into an Excel sheet and perform various forms of routine might well be reduced. And instead, we have more higher quality data science type of jobs where we actually tackle problems with code, machine learning techniques, and automation. Similarly, low impact data science jobs where you probably build great models in Jupyter Notebook just to be put on the shelf and never get used will hopefully give way to real impactful data science jobs. I recently came across a super interesting book called Bullshit Jobs by David Graeber. It argues that up to 40% of jobs in the world today are actually bullshit. If it's true, it's terrifying. And this number is not come up by the author, it is actual people who admit to him that they think their jobs are bullshit. They feel their jobs are pretty much pointless and if their job disappeared tomorrow, no one in the world would notice it had gone. And the world would actually even be a better place if their job disappeared. But people do the job anyway because they get paid and in many cases get paid very well for it. One of the categories of bullshit jobs resonated with me so deeply is a duct taping kind of jobs. For example, in a company, the IT system is broken and the data is not collected properly in the pipeline, but the management somehow decides that it's better to hire people to duct tape the system temporarily instead of fixing, automating, or rebuilding the system to make it work more properly. I've witnessed this so many times in my career as a consultant. I think during an economic downturn, companies will get pressure to hire people more strategically and innovate more quickly to stay relevant. So I have a naive hope that the quality of the data science jobs will actually be improved and also to cut costs, companies might offer more opportunities to work remotely, which would be a good thing if you want to be flexible. Moving on to the next point, even if there's no looming recession, I'd highly encourage you to switch side from a consumer to a producer. Instead of consuming the knowledge and keep it for yourself, you also want to create projects, contribute and distribute knowledge. This goes the same for normal goods and services. Instead of buying stuff, which is actually consuming, you could produce things and provide it to people who need them. One of the things that I started doing a few years ago is to start writing on Medium and sharing what I know, and now also making content on YouTube, I've turned myself from a consumer of knowledge to a producer. By doing this, I helped keep myself learning, building a portfolio for myself, earn some extra income next to my day job, and the coolest thing is to help people around the world to develop their careers too. I think consuming stuff could make you happy in the short run, but this producer mindset will be the one that provides the long-lasting benefits and satisfaction. So if you have a startup idea that can solve a problem and you have some technical and coding skill, obviously because you're a data nerd or you know people who can help, this may be a very good time to explore that idea. In history, we have seen many unicorn companies founded during recessions. In the most recent global recession, we saw unicorns companies like Uber, Pinterest, and Airbnb come into the world. The economic downturns have proved to offer some good opportunities Firstly, slow economic growth, weed out old-fashioned business models, clunky systems, and bad products. This creates space for new technology, new products, and services. Secondly, there's less competition for top talents, so it's easier to hire people, which wouldn't be the case when there's a strong economic growth. And also, office space is going to be cheaper to rent. So if you have a great idea, this could be one of the cheaper times to pursue it. This is if you have some safety net and feel 
feel comfortable enough to take the risk. In any adventures, I believe we can go very far by creating peer groups to grow together. If you are looking for collaboration or need a community of like-minded people who love data science and tech, you can join my Discord channel, link in the description, where there are now more than 2,000 members who are learning together and helping each other grow. I believe that each and every one of us has our own sweet spot in our career. That's where what we do best suits our skills, talents, and personality. So whatever happens in the economy this year or next year, you can take it as a sign for change. In data science and tech, there are many different roles you can try, different things you can explore, and see what works best for you. Don't easily settle when you don't know what your sweet spot is. I still don't know exactly what it is for myself, although I do have some vague idea of what it is, so I'm still very much in the exploratory phase. Studies have shown that successful artists and scientists often use the strategy of first exploration and later exploitation. This means early in their careers, the artists or scientists experiment with a variety of styles and topics, and once they got a hot streak, meaning they get some success with a particular style or topic, they begin repeating whatever brought them success. That's how Jules Verne kept writing extraordinary voyages throughout his 40-year career after his first hot streak, the first successful novel of this type. And then he would later die extremely rich, proving that writing novels can actually be a better career choice than selling stocks. I think this is a very nice food for thought for some of us who are feeling uncertain about what to do next or anxious about finding jobs or losing jobs. I guess this is probably part of the whole journey. And who knows, you might find a great heart streak along the way that will transform your career forever. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you do, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. And also don't forget to check out other videos on my channel for data science skills and tech content. Thank you and see you in the next video. Bye bye.